Good evening. I'm Gregory Hemming. I'm the co-founder and senior advisor to the Center for Local Prosperity, and I'm pleased to be your host for these dialogues this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge them as past, present, and future caretakers of the land. Since around night, uh, since 2014, the Center for Local Prosperity has been in, uh, uh, engaging Atlantic Canadians in conversations, research, and publications on local economics, food security, and community energy. In 2017, in collaboration with the Thinkers Lodge, we expanded that vision to include climate change and indigenous rights. And you can get in, uh, additional information on the work of the Center for Local Prosperity at our website, uh, centerforlocalprosperity.ca, and on Eventbrite, uh, where you can get information on this particular dialogue. We have expanded this dialogue uh, to two hours, as opposed to an hour and a half. Uh, the, the dialogue we had a, a week and a half ago, uh, we felt that an hour and a half was a little short to let the speakers develop their, their particular point of view and to allow adequate time for questions and answers. Uh, so we'll go for two hours. The presentations will last approximately an hour and a half, which allows uh, 30 minutes for questions and answers. So as questions come to you, if you just put that in the question and answer box, I will see those and I'll make every effort to, uh, uh, for me or the panelists to answer as many of those as possible. Um, most of us, I think, are very aware of this predicament that we've gotten ourselves into. Some of us have, I think, been onto this since the early 70s. Others are kind of recent converts as the, the crisis begins to descend uh, and the, extremity, uh, the, uh, the extreme weather starts to, uh, start to engulf us. So just this morning I got up and I just usually read a few newspapers and I just clipped off a few headlines. So let me read you about four of these headlines. And I didn't grab them out in any particular order. I just, I just went through the newspaper. Here's one, a heat wave in Seattle Extreme weather is no longer unprecedented. It has become the norm. This is serious enough for the 1% to start building bunkers, bunkers ready for environmental collapse. Another, hundreds of people have visited uh, uh, emergency departments in urgent care facilities in the Pacific Northwest since Friday. As many as 230 deaths have been reported and an excruciating heat wave smashed all time records in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Temperatures soared in BC to 46.6 degrees on Monday, shattering records for an area where few are set up for such intense heat. Experts and officials fear that the catastrophic conditions fueled by the climate crisis will only get worse from the, for the coming months. China is in the middle of a huge power crunch as extreme weather, surging demand for energy and strict limits on coal usage deliver a triple blow to the nation's electricity grid. A problem that could last for months, straining the, county, the country's economic recovery and weighing heavy on global trade and threatening future growth. And the last one, the urgency of the climate crisis uh, is no longer in doubt. An IPCC document leaked earlier this week warns that the consequences of the climate crisis, including rising seas, intense heat, and ecosystem collapse, will fundamentally reshape life on Earth in the coming decades, even if fossil fuels emissions are curbed immediately. These sort of headlines, in my mind, are further evidence that we're now facing inevitable climate, biodiversity, and societal breakdown. In order to avoid a collapse, we must immediately begin to uh, total and collaborative reimagination of what the thinker Thomas Homer Dixon calls uh, WITS, W-I-T-S, worldviews, institutions, and technologies. 
The Center for Local Prosperity, through its continued focus on local, remains hopeful that from these reimagined wits, breakthrough to avoid collapse will begin to emerge. These dialogues the center is presenting over the next two months are all about the emergence of new homegrown wits, new worldviews, institutions, and technologies in Atlantic Canada. It goes without saying that by far the most powerful set of worldviews, institutions, and technologies currently revolve around the idea of continued and limitless economic growth. Our policies, politics, and practices are rooted in growth and have now, in the words of Zen poet Gary Snyder, become a growth monster. This monster, in the words of Daniel Savoie, have given us a world in which economic space is far greater, more influential, much harder to identify and control than is political space. Last week's dialogue on governance left little doubt that government is always reluctant to do away with old ways of doing things, even when faced with new and terrifying predicaments. Instead, governments insist on keeping the old system and simply add new ones on top of the old. This is a move toward political and economic chaos that has resulted an increased sense of citizen powerlessness, market failure, and societal breakdown. Is there a way to rein in the growth monster, to restore a fair and regenerative democracy, and to begin to promote an ecologically competent and active citizenry? I hope so. One ray of hope is the possible and gradual shift away from our current economy based on unlimited growth towards one that is stable or mildly, mildly fluctuating in size, an economy that allows for and results in local and a global rethink of GDP growth and leans towards other measures of well being, and one that includes a mix of in, indigenous, indigenous <clears throat> local economic substitution value-added industries, homegrown, neighborly, and regenerative, uh, regenerative and swift. All of these, way, all of these ways of new thinking and acting can help slay the growth monster in Atlantic Canada. They can clear us a path to, hope, uh, uh, to host a land-based series of local economic activities and practices, as well as lay out a game plan for sustainable resource management. They may even lead to establishing here in Atlantic Canada, the first regenerative steady state pilot initiatives. Brian Check, founder and executive director of the Center for Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Anders Hayden, the associate professor of political science at Dalhousie University and Chris Gugu, CEO of Ulnawig, uh, an indigenous organization, and the executive director of Ulnawig uh, Community Foundation. Join me this evening for the second in our dialogue series, Economic Growth at the Crossroads, a shift to steady state regenerative economy in Atlantic Canada. Brian, in your perspective, can you lay out for us uh, what your, your view of a steady state economy and how that might differ from this economic model that, uh, that we're living under now. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much, Gregory, for the, uh, for the intro and, and the really great background backgrounder for the uh, conference. So I'll, I, I'd like to actually share my screen and show some slides. Uh, to describe what a steady state economy is to start with. <clears throat> and so let me go to the share function down here and share that PowerPoint show. And are people uh, now seeing a, a PowerPoint show? Yes. Okay, 
<clears throat> and so, uh, you know, I, I snatched this PowerPoint presentation from uh, an intro for our interns that we have every semester. And I had to think of uh, something to change the subtitle to. And I think I decided to just call it real sustainability because at Cassie, uh, we like to say that sustainability is the steady state economy. But I think the way to, to uh, define the steady state economy is to start out by reminding ourselves what economic growth is. Because we talk all the time about economic growth, but a lot, uh, many of us never stop to think about what that really is and how it's defined. And so it's an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. And so it's typically expressed in terms of GDP or gross domestic product. And it entails a growing population and or per capita production and consumption of goods and services. And that means then that degrowth or recession, as you may know it, is a, a decrease in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. That's a key phrase that we'll come back to, um, but it's typically, again, expressed in terms of GDP. And, and so that would entail a decreasing population and or per capita consumption. And so the thing in the middle there, that's the steady state economy where you have stabilized level of production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. You may have some sectors growing rapidly and some declining rapidly, but in the aggregate, it's a, a, a stabilized production and consumption. And it again is typically expressed in terms of GDP. GDP tells you the size of the economy not much else, uh, the size of the economy, and frankly, the level of environmental impact. We'll be getting to that too, uh, because it, it entails stabilized population and or per capita consumption uh, to be sustainable. So here it is graphically in a nutshell, you know, uh, we know that that's not sustainable and uh, certainly perpetual degrowth wouldn't be sustainable. So the sustainable alternative then, that's the steady state economy. That's why we like to say sustainability is a steady state economy. And uh, as Gregory mentioned earlier, you know, there's no such thing as a flat line GDP. You couldn't get one if you just concentrated all your policy goals at it. Uh, at best, there'd be a mildly fluctuating GDP and ideally, it would be fluctuating somewhere around an optimum level, not just merely sustainable, but optimal for the environment, for society, for national security, international stability. And so, you know, you see that we wear the, this message on our sleeve with the Cassie logo. It's a steady state economy. By the way, you know, you may have heard of things like uh, uh, half Earth, half Earth Day. Uh, or, uh, nature needs half that's a related initiative and I guess we were kind of like the original half earthers because our logo you know shows a split of half of the uh, uh, nature remaining for wildlife and uh, and for pre-industrial times let's say as well and then half you know for the economy well getting a little bit ahead of things but now let that's been kind of theoretical. Now let's look on the ground at what an economy really is. And uh, I'd say at this point in history, it pretty much starts here. And here being the breadbasket of North America, this is looking down uh, at Kansas. And if you've been there, you know what that is. It's pivot agriculture. And here it's probably, uh, the, the irrigation is probably a Roundup Ready soybeans, very industrialized farming, and it's drawing the uh, water from the Oglala Aquifer. This is pivot agricultural viewed from above in Saudi Arabia. And in that part of the world, this is a little more what it looks like on the ground. This one's actually from Qatar. But the point here is that in just about every part of the world now, even in places where 
you know, ostensibly it looked like there's a lot of water. Uh, we find that there's a shortage of water because we're living in a world of 89 trillion GDP. That was pre-pandemic and you know, everybody's hell bent on getting back to that level. And at that level and long before that level, you hit water stresses uh, in every re agricultural region of the planet and every economic region starts with an agricultural region. And <clears throat> that's gonna be a major point here real soon. But here's what happens when, the, when these uh, aquifers start to dry out and also with global heating, you start to lose uh, soil integrity and lose agricultural production. Well, you know, that's just the agricultural sector in a, a whirlwind. If we look at some of the other closely related extractive sectors, we find similar stresses, you know, the clear cutting in the timber industry and the uh, mountaintop removal in the mining industry and, you know, horrible overgrazing problems all over out west that have been overlooked now for decades in the face of climate change and fire issues out there and everything, but horrible overgrazing from extremely uh, intensive livestock production on our public lands. Well, you know, only after you have plenty of this kind of activity, starting with the agricultural and extractive sectors, do you get to this heavy manufacturing activity. You can't have any of that unless you have the material uh, to refine and, and to uh, produce. So you, you, you get into the heavy manufacturing industries then and, uh, and you get into manufacturing in general into lighter and lighter forms thereof and, and a lot of manufacturing that mixes quite a bit of heavy and light components and, uh, and, and with technological progress, even, you know, onto the uh, production of robotics and, and even uh, a tremendous amount of production of the containers to ship all, this all these manufacturers. So uh, you have a lot of that kind of activity before you get to the very lightest types of, of manufacturing like computer chip manufacturing and uh, uh, which not only has a very direct ecological footprint, but you've seen, I think now that it stems from, it starts with all this ecological footprint. And, you know, you might say, well, now you're sort of grading or gradating into um, an information economy more on that in just a moment, but I guess we forgot here the uh, infrastructure, which you, you could perhaps look at that as, as a special case of heavy manufacturing, but this is really best categorized as infrastructure uh, to transport a lot of the materials that are being agriculturally and extractively produced or redirected. And simply for the uh, circulation of the goods and services and labor and capital as well. And, at, and of course, at the very base, you needed the energy to fuel all of this activity. So we find, you know, this becoming more and more intense up in Canada too, like in the tar sands in Alberta. And, uh, but, you know, all over the world now, you find really uh, intense pressures on the land for energy production. And then at the far end of that spectrum or that tailpipe, at the, at the uh, end of that throughput spectrum, you have the tailpipe uh, with increasing amounts in the aggregate once again, and, uh, and, and more horrific episodes of pollution, uh, not so much because we're not having any technological progress, but because in the aggregate, uh, there must be more pollution uh, as a function of the second law of thermodynamics, entropy law. Well, you know, in conventional economics, there's uh, very little talk of any of this really, or certainly those first few slides, because conventional growth theory revolves around what we might call 
the landless production function, going all the way back to when Robert Solo developed the basic model of growth in 1956 and going through it, some of its major stages uh, of development, including the Romer model in the early 90s with endogenizing technological progress, whatever. There's some brilliant material in, these, in this model of growth, but they all start with this, uh, with the basic formula that production is a function of capital and labor. And if, if you uh, think about the economy like that, in such a simplified manner, uh, as, as you do if you're like, say, an introductory business student. Oh, and by the way, what's the most common major <laughs> in North America? I believe it's business. I'm not 100% sure, but it's certainly one of the you know, most populated schools, business schools. Typical business textbook reflecting this extremely simplified version that left out the land We'll, we'll show you the circular flow of money between businesses and households or capital and primarily labor. And so then your vision of economic growth is like this, you know, this ever expanding circular flow of money, 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 more and more. And where, is it, where are the bounds to that? So in ecological macroeconomics, you know, we try to rectify that we start out with uh with a planet <laughs> like there was before there was ever any economy like there was before there were any humans and uh with a solar system and and you know and then we say yes you do have a circular flow of money but don't forget it requires the the use of these stocks of natural capital the woods the waters the soils the minerals the fisheries, and uh, and again, pursuant to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, you will have pollution, energy and, and heat pollution stemming from uh, the, the uh, impossibility of 100% efficiency in the economic production process. And so, you know, with this vision, you can see right away that there's a limit to the growth and some of the problems that, that the growth is causing. And uh, now, by the way, the, this structure of the economy we've been talking about, starting with the agricultural and building thereon, we call this the trophic theory of money because, uh, well, in ecology, we talk about trophic levels. In fact, in ecology, when you think about uh, wildlife in the aggregate, biodiversity, plants and animal species, you think about them as uh, occupying these basic trophic levels, starting with the producers. And those are the, the plants. They literally produce via the process of photosynthesis. And uh, when there's enough of that plant production, surplus plant production uh, for reproduction of plants and, and more, then you can begin to have uh, the animals that eat the plants, and those are called primary consumers. And when you have enough of those, then you can have the secondary consumers, those that eat the primary consumers. And, uh, and yes, you have species in the economy of nature that are nicely classified as service providers as well, like decomposers and, and pollinators and scavengers. But uh, none of those proliferate without the original proliferation at the productive base of the trophic structure. And uh, philosophically, why not include humans in that, right? I mean, uh, it would not have made sense not to a million years ago. With Homo sapiens in the mix, it's clearly one of the, the species on earth. And uh, the you would have to place it then at the the pinnacle of this trophic structure able to eat at this point in evolutionary history or in create, created history, you know, able to consume any other, other species on the planet and inhabit just about any uh, spot on the planet. 
And so then when we do look at it this way, it's helpful fast forwarding to 2021 because, or to the process of economic growth, because then we can see that, well, what does economic growth look like? Uh, the, the portion um, covered by homo sapiens isn't like that, it's more like this. And it's sort of like a trophic compression squeezing out in the ecological uh, terms of competitive exclusion. It's like the competitive exclusion of non-human species in the aggregate. Well, uh, another way of putting this, again, kind of theoretically, but I think it helps to round it out a little, is that uh, economic growth, once again, in terms of GDP, uh, it's simply a process of reallocating the natural capital that we talked about, wood, water, and et cetera. It's, it's reallocating. It's, it's a reallocation from the economy of nature, where remember, all that had comprised wildlife habitats. And by the way, I may, I, I'm going to throw in there, you know, Chris, I think we'll have much, much more to say about this, but that natural capital uh, nurtured tribes as well, the tribal cultures. Well, all that natural capital is getting reallocated now to the human economy. And in particular, you know, this extremely industrialized and information computerized industrialized uh, economy where, where it is transformed into producer and consumer goods and services. Uh, the wildlife profession and the fisheries profession have been all over this too. Uh, they kind of backed off in recent years, but they took early steps, especially the Wildlife Society back in 2000. In, uh, and then especially a few years later when they adopted a position, a policy statement, recognizing the fundamental conflict between economic growth and wildlife conservation. But just a quick aside here for the ecologists out there. This is one of my favorite images. It's like a you know, they say a picture speaks a thousand words. This is like a collage speaking thousands of words because you see an economy coming out of the proverbial wilderness here. And uh, it starts out by, by pushing at these large bodied or case selected species as, as they're referred to. And then the economy, it's evolving and growing, developing its extractive sectors and heavy manufacturing. You know, you got to use your imagination a little bit, <laughs> looking between the trees and stuff, but building up into the urban core, all those things you saw in the slides and many more in spades, you know, and uh, with this technological progress, allowing the economy to creep into every little nook and cranny of the economy of nature and liquidating and reallocating more and more of the types and amounts of, of natural capital until it's finally endangering even these little R selected species like insects. And uh, once again, the competitive exclusion of non-human species in the aggregate. So, you know, in the human economy, the, the human economy has a trophic structure as well. Uh, it's based upon the producers. In other words, agricultural and extractive sectors. And we, we saw the slides, we looked around the world in a whirlwind tour. And then we saw that once you get enough of that, you will have heavy manufacturing, then you have light manufacturing. And yes, with, with a, a technologically advanced uh, species like Homo sapiens, you have a tremendous diversity of service provision as well. But once again, a key point here is that what's being provided for by these services? Well, it's got to get past the invisible hand of the market to matter for GDP purposes, for economic growth purposes. And to do that, it's got to be able to serve these other economic sectors, you know, and uh, so it, the service sectors don't expand except via the expansion of the whole integrated economy. 
And the, the trophic theory of money is that money originates via the agricultural surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor into the manufacturing and service sectors. So, you know, the reason for calling it this is uh, it places the uh, a policy point right out front and center that not only is the growth of that real economy that we looked at in the slides, uh, a life crushing problem in the 21st century. It's also a, a, a monetary issue. If you've got monetary policy for growing that economy, you're gonna have the, the same problems because before any of this stuff, before any of this stuff that supposedly has a lighter per capita footprint, uh, you're going to have to have more of this stuff, more of this stuff. And so you end up in the aggregate having a greater ecological footprint as the economy grows. Well, yeah, and then the primary corollary is that the quantity of money, which is a st the stock of money and GDP as the, the macroeconomic flow of money indicates the amount of agricultural surplus and related activity at the trophic base. Remember now that's the extractive activity. And therefore it indicates the environmental impact of the economy. And so here's a, you know, one more slide with that trophic structure and showing that as the economy grows, you know, it's not just that circular flow uh, growing into nowhere, it's this, it's this expansion of the trophic base, taking up more space, more habitats, uh, more places to dispose of wastes, and it's growing, therefore, uh, its environmental impact in lockstep with GDP. Well, yeah, I guess I, I jumped the gun a little bit on the stock and flow distinction, but, uh, uh, there's a stock of money, uh, and and then you know GDP is the monetary value of all final goods and services produced annually within a country's borders. That's the textbook definition, and it's the the macroeconomic flow of money that has to reflect that stock of money for the money supply not to be inflated. And I think it really helps us to. Uh, know some of the basics at least of how GDP is calculated and the, the, uh, the, the, the so-called fundamental identity of national income accounting, which tells us that production equals income equals expenditures. So this helps us to understand that there's no somehow uh, fuzzy way uh, new monetary policy or new monetary theory, any kind of, uh, um, th there's no way to decouple the expenditure of money in the real economy from its trophic base of agricultural and extractive uh, impact. And so then we, you know, we would prefer to look at, uh, instead of just this circular flow of money growing on the planet, oops, Oh, there's a slide missing here. It's supposed to phase into that trophic, that trophically structured economy expanding across the planet. And yet we hear that, well, we hear this, this notion of the environmental Kuznets curve, which is that, yes, yes, we have more environmental problems as the economy grows. Uh, but you know what, folks, when it, when it grows enough, especially in per capita terms, well, then we can just, uh, we can solve all those problems. We can throw enough money back at them as to somehow solve them. <laughs> and the, the, notion, the notion behind the environmental Kuznets curve is simply redounds to uh, the process of technological progress, which in economic terms means more output per unit input. And, uh, but people have gotten carried away, starting with the aforementioned Solo, who said, you know, the world can in effect get along without natural resources. He is partially tongue in cheek with that. 
Uh, I'm convinced based on context and other writings and subsequent uh, explanation and stuff, but some people haven't been. And, you know, you have entire like Cato institutes out there devoted to the and competitive enterprise institutes that'll try to tell you as they did at an award ceremony, awarding this guy who said that natural resources originate from the mine, not from the ground and therefore are not depletable. Well, uh, I wish we could, I wish we had a whole half hour to talk about technological progress because I'd like to uh, talk about how it actually happens and how it's linked at the hip with GDP growth based upon previous levels of technology and how you never uh, escape uh, the pressures on the environment by growing GDP uh, via technological progress. But Brian, we got it. That, that, that Brian, that's great. Okay. Yeah, that that's um, um, I think I think that's a good place to, to slow down here for a second, and uh, uh, and we can pick up some of this uh, in questions later. All right. But um, I just had a few more slides, but uh, oh, okay. go go ahead. Take yeah. take another take another minute and go through them there. Okay. Yeah, optimal scale, we talked about this. Is it optimal? Well, maybe for some people uh, we want more, but for a lot of us, it's already way beyond optimal. And that's a big challenge for democracy. Uh, optimal scale in economic terms. And you know, we have metrics we can use to help us muddle toward optimality, but you gotta start with GDP as the measure of the size of the economy. And, uh, and then you add on, you know, the things that it's starting to, to cost, you know, and then you figure out, oh, okay, maybe we need to degrow that in order to protect some of these. And, uh, you know, we have policies at, uh, at Cassie to accomplish a steady state economy, uh, which you can find at steadystate.org. And those people that are already on board with the steady state economy, Greg, I got to, I always forget this and the thing ends and we didn't get it done. Go to steady state hour and sign the position calling for the transition from growth to a steady state economy. You'll be joining a great uh, collection of 15,000 uh, very notable signatories. All right, and uh, in steady statesmanship, we move this to the international diplomacy level using the ecological footprint and given the trophic theory of money gdp per capita to backtrack the ecological footprint of the wealthiest nations and then the hope is that through this diplomacy for the last slide uh you know the usa's and canada's and western europe's and they they uh in they they help with this diplomatic uh, effort and, and by sharing more basically in the simplest of terms, and we all end up better off in the long run. Uh, and that's pretty much, pretty much the slideshow there. Great, Brian, thank you so much. I, I would encourage all of us to visit uh, steadystate.org. There's, there's just a, a whole host of very good information on that site. And that petition that, uh, that um, Brian talked about is important because I think it sets the transition in motion. I'd like to switch gears just slightly uh, um, um, to, to Anders. Uh, Anders has uh, presented many years ago uh, to uh, a conference that the Center for Local Prosperity did. And I know since that period of time, you've been working hard to really grapple with this idea of GDP and have, have worked on that pretty intensively over the last year or so, and uh, may be able to dazzle us with a book here in the near future on that. I look forward to that. But um, uh, Andrews, I, I'd like your view of, of uh, this state of the world, state of the economy that we're in, and your look at GDP. Okay, yeah, thanks Gregory. Um, I also have some slides, so just uh, give me one second here to get this set up okay can you can you folks see that yep okay yes. 
so when uh, when Gregory asked me about participating in, in the event tonight, um, you know, I kind of cautioned him that um, when it comes to thinking about a steady state economy in Atlantic Canada, we've got a lot more questions than answers. So I'm certainly not here to offer anything close to a blueprint, uh, but hopefully I can say some things that help to uh, advance the conversation. Um, and I'm also gonna use a slightly different framing um, in terms of not, not focusing specifically on the concept of the steady state economy, but on a closely related and parallel set of issues, ideas about moving beyond GDP and the role that that plays in chipping away at the broader phenomenon of growth paradigm. We can also think of some of the limits of this as well. Um, now, uh, hold on, let me just try to get my slides to advance here. Okay. Um, now, one of the ways to, to think about the challenge that we're facing uh, is in terms of the need to confront the growth paradigm. Now, one of the descriptions of what the growth paradigm is comes from Matthias Schmelzer. He says that it consists of four key ideas or discourses. Uh, the first idea is that GDP correctly measures economic activity. That's how he puts it, but I think he, what he really means and the, and the more fundamental point that I wanna emphasize, uh, I'll frame it a little bit differently. This is the assumption that the level of GDP measures economic welfare. So I think that's sort of the, a, a, the key point that I wanna emphasize here. Second idea, uh, in the growth paradigm is that GDP growth serves as a magic wand or a panacea to solve key uh, societal challenges. So whether it's a matter of poverty or un unemployment or avoiding political conflicts over the distribution of resources, GDP has come to be seen as the solution. And um, I think as Brian touched on, some people even go as far as, as depicting GDP growth as necessary to give us the resources to solve our environmental challenges. Um, now, third is the idea that GDP growth is practically the same thing as progress or well being, you know, or national power or national success. So, various framings on this are all very similar, um, or it's a necessary means to achieve those goals. And, you know, we've seen some variations of that here in Atlantic Canada. You know, we have a relatively low GDP per capita, at least by Canadian standards, and that's led to the label of this being you know, a have not region, a sort of sense of being less than uh, the rest of the country. And then the fourth point is that, GD, uh, that growth, GDP growth is essentially limitless. And that's a fundamentally problematic uh, idea as, as Brian has, has outlined. Now, these ideas haven't gone uncontested. There's a, there are a variety of different approaches that have emerged, you know, people trying to challenge these ideas in various ways. The concept of a steady state economy is one of, you know, is a central, a central approach, also ideas around degrowth. There's the donut economics concept that Kate Rayworth has put forward. And also one of the places where some of these ideas have been challenged uh, has been in the debate around beyond GDP or the beyond GDP movement. Um, and it basically puts, emphasizes and highlights the limits of GDP as a measure of well being or prosperity. Um, so GDP, you know, as Brian explained, measures the monetary value of economic output, uh, but it doesn't measure some important things. It fails to account for environmental costs. It doesn't account for unsustainability. It doesn't account for the inequality in the distribution of income or wealth. It doesn't account for the value of non-market economic activity, all the household labor, the volunteer labor that's very valuable, but doesn't count in this measure. And so this kind of critique is, is actually now um, increasingly wide, widely accepted. Um, even increasingly amongst conventional economists. Um, and, and there's been an increasing recognition that alternatives to GDP are needed. Alter alternatives are needed for a, a new, new measures of well being, prosperity, or national success. Now, I won't get into all the details of all the different options. There are a lot of different possibilities. The main alternatives involve making monetary adjustments to GDP. So the genuine progress indicator, the GPI, is, an, is a major example of that approach. There are various composite well-being indices that take a number of different indicators and aggregate them into a single number. We see that in the Human Development Index, the HDI, the, the Canadian Index of Well-being, uh, the CIW, or Bhutan's GNH, of course, National Happiness. 
Um, there's also been increasing the emphasis in recent years on the last two options here, dashboards of multiple indicators. You're not trying to combine everything, but keeping the measures uh, you know, separate and, and, and that you can view, view in, in isolation and separately. And also a lot of emphasis recently on subjective well-being uh, or, or happiness measurement. Now, one of the other points that I want to emphasize is that when talking about beyond GDP, this isn't primarily about or fundamentally about ending the calculation of GDP. There might be some people that are calling for that, but I don't think that's not really the point. That's not the core idea. There are a variety of different arguments about why GDP still provides useful information. The point is, is that it shouldn't be misused as an indicator of well-being, prosperity, or success, and we need alternatives for that for that purpose. Now, one other thing that I just to give some background that I think is important in this to, to understand this debate, there are different visions at play. I make a distinction between the transformative and the reformist vision. So for some of the people involved in this debate, this quest for alternative indicators is not just about moving beyond GDP as a measurement, it's really about moving beyond uh, economic growth as a societal priority. So the work of many ecological economists, you know, starting with Herman Daly's work on the index of sustainable economic welfare can be seen in that light. Um, there are other people that emphasize transformation in, largely on the, in the social sphere, you know, emphasize linking new measurements to redistrib redistributing power or resources or prioritizing reduction of poverty and inequality. Um, and at the same time, we have maybe a, you know, a less radical, a less challenging, what I call a reformist vision that sees alternative indicators mainly as a tool for better policymaking within the existing system, but without challenging the growth paradigm or without challenging other core features of the existing economy. And I think this has become, this latter reformist vision has become the dominant approach within, uh, within the political mainstream. Now, here in Nova Scotia, we've had um, a lot of work in this area. Um, it's been a very you know, um, fruitful place for this kind of work, um, starting with the work by uh, the group GPI Atlantic led by Ron Coleman, I imagine, um, many of you uh, are familiar with that. You know, this, his work goes back to 1997. Uh, they produced a series of really interesting, innovative reports um, that looked at different spheres of economy and society, trying to calculate the full costs and benefits of various forms of economic and social activity. Um, I think this was really valuable, real trailblazing work that I think has helped um, increase awareness of the limits of GDP in this, in this region and also created some, an important foundation for some of the later beyond GDP efforts that we've seen. And certainly, you know, Ron Coleman's work has very much lodged in the, that transformative approach, really thinking about new measurements, linking them to efforts to, to shift to a new post-growth economic paradigm. Now, more recently, we've seen a Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative. This is led by Engage Nova Scotia, which is headed by Danny Graham, the former uh, leader of the Liberal Party in Nova Scotia. Uh, one of the first things they did was a survey a few years ago. They found that 68% of people agreed that we should measure Nova Scotia's success by the growth in our economy, but a, a notably higher number, 81%, agreed to measuring success by improvement in our quality of life. Um, since then, according to Danny Graham, that the gap is, is grown, more and more fa people favoring the focus on measuring quality of life. Now, um, th this initiative led to um, um, a release of, an, of a Nova Scotia Quality of Life Index in 2018. It uses the Canadian Index of Wellbeing Framework. I won't go into all the details of that, but basically that can give you a single composite index, but also a, you know, a really broad dashboard of 64 different indicators. And in fact, those individual numbers in some ways are maybe more useful than the, the overall uh, index. Um, now, Engage Nova Scotia also did a, a quality of life survey in 2019. It's generated a, a wealth of data about quality of life in the province, how it differs among, between different regions, amongst different groups within society, also gets at perceptions of environmental quality. And uh, you know, there's work ongoing in sort of interpreting and thinking about how to respond to that data. Now, I think this approach has kind of fits more clearly in, in the, the reformist camp that I outlined earlier. Um, 
That said, it, it does put forward a message that success is about more than dollar, just dollars and cents. So that sort of subtly downplays the focus on GDP growth. I think the way some of the, that this approach has, uh, that this initiative has highlighted some of the non-material forms of wealth that are abundant in this part of the world, you know, the strength of communities, the quality of our natural environment. I think it has some value in putting forward a different story about what matters. Um, so I think it represents kind of a, a soft critique of the growth paradigm, but not really a, a direct challenge to it. Now, this kind of work is starting to see, you're starting to see some of these ideas make their way into um, statements by political leaders, most notably Premier Rankin in Nova Scotia made a statement recently about how there's a better way to measure success and define progress in the lives of Nova Scotians, you know, by shifting our focus from purely economic measures to well-being and, and quality of life. Um, he went on to say that the, the pandemic has accelerated the thinking about measuring su success of societies, making us realize uh, that GDP is just one of several important measures. So what to make of a statement like that? Well, I think on the one hand, given the, given the fact you know, given how deeply rooted GDP has been as an indicator of success for governments, I think it's, it's a step forward of some kind when a government leader downplays the centrality of GDP growth and, and, and they downplays its centrality as the overriding indicator of progress. But there's also some, some real limits to, to, to this. Um, I think there's cer certainly some questions still about what, how much substantive policy change is gonna follow. There's some reasons for skepticism about that. Um, and there's still, more fundamentally, there's still no clear sign of a shift away from pursuing GDP growth um, as one of the main goals of government and, and as a means to achieve uh, well-being and quality of life, which I think is increasingly how it's being seen. Now, some countries have taken this, these ideas a little further. Um, I think some of the countries that have done so are those that have expressly committed to a well-being economy. There's a group of well-being economy governments, consists of New Zealand, uh, Finland, Wales, Iceland, and Scotland. They have linked their measurement initiatives, their new beyond GDP measurements to a shift in overarching goals. So for example, in, in Scotland, the first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has stated that Scotland is redefining what it means to be a successful country, uh, putting well-being at the heart of what we're doing. And I think that an interesting statement that went even further in, in terms of the direction of a, of, a, of a critique of the growth paradigm came from Iceland's prime minister who's spoken about the need to develop a new economic model, which is centered on well-being rather than on production and consumption. It's called for a, a change in the way we live to address uh, climate change. Um, so these sound like promising developments and I, and I think in some ways they are, um, but at the same time we, have, in practice, these countries are still pursuing GDP growth, not so much as the goal anymore, but still as a means that they think is necessary to increase well-being, you know, to address issues like unemployment or to generate the revenue needed for public spending. So growth isn't being seen as the end goal anymore for these governments, but its pursuit still hasn't been abandoned. So this is certainly not a complete step. We might think of it as a transitional step in which GDP growth is being displaced from its position as the overriding goal, but it still hasn't gone away. It's still being pursued to, to achieve other goals. Now, I wanna come back to that the slide that I presented earlier about the four items in the ideas in, in the growth paradigm, um, you know, that Schmelzer highlights. Um, so the first idea again was that GDP uh, correctly measures economic activity. And I really wanna more emphasize the more fundamental point that it, the idea that it measures economic welfare. I think it's fair to say that the beyond GDP movements had considerable success in challenging this idea. I think there's still work to do, but it's not only ecological economists or environmental activists who see the limitations uh, of, of GDP for this purpose. Even you know, inter international institutions like the OECD uh, you know, get the point now. Um, now, there's the second idea that GDP growth serves as a, a magic wand or a panacea to solve uh, societal challenges. Um, I think there's increasing recognition that GDP growth is not a magic solution on its own. I think it's abundantly clear that GDP growth is not enough to solve problems of poverty or inequality. It's certainly not adequate to solve our environmental challenges. 
But the mainstream response to these issues has, has typically been to call for additional action to try to make growth green and inclusive. Okay, so there's these challenges to this idea have only been, I think, partly, partly successful so far and certainly haven't shaken um, you know, the political mainstream's commitment to growth. And I think one reason for that has to do with the next point. Um, and this is you know, the, the idea that GDP growth is practically the same as progress, well-being, or national power, or it's a necessary means to those goals. So on the one hand, I think there has been considerable success in challenging the idea that GDP growth is equivalent to progress or well-being. I think that idea is increasingly widely accepted. Um, I think maybe less so, there's been less success in challenging the idea that GDP growth is, is a key element of national power, particularly you know, in, in, in the, you know, in, among the, in the big powers, you know, the United States and China. Um, but the, the issue that I want to really highlight as, as a core obstacle is the perception, we might say the reality, we can debate how best to put this point, um, but the idea that greedy, the GDP growth is still needed to achieve well-being. In other words, the idea that we, our institutions have become structurally dependent on growth. And this is, this is a core problem, okay? Um, no, the, the fourth, the, the final element of the growth paradigm, the idea that growth is essentially limitless. I think there's still a lot of people that support this idea, particularly in powerful places. Um, it's also been challenged by, you know, the evidence of a growing ecological crisis. It's gonna be further challenged to the extent that ecological conditions deteriorate further. Um, but one of the, I think one of the key obstacles on this point is that even amongst policymakers who accept the idea of limits to growth, um, they're not fully sure of how to respond to that. There was an interesting study coming out of Finland a few years ago um, that found that many people working in government, even people working in business, um, a certain number of them were critical of, of the growth paradigm, of the growth economy, but they didn't know how to break from existing patterns. They didn't have a, a complete degrowth story that told them what they could do instead. They didn't have an understanding of how to make a break from how we do things currently to how we could do things differently. And I think that is closely related to the previous point I was making about you know, the perceived need for growth, the structural dependence on growth. Okay, so, so where do we go from here? Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I don't have a blueprint to offer. I have some thoughts that I hope can help advance the conversation a little bit. Um, I wanna draw um, on, on a recent piece that's been written by Tim Jackson, one of the key post-growth thinkers. And he's written about a threefold beyond GDP strategy. First, changing the way we measure success. You know, that's, I think that process is well underway, not, although not yet complete as, as we discussed. The second idea is building a consistent policy framework for a well-being economy. I haven't had time really to go into these issues, but the basic idea is that we need to do more than just changing the measurements. We need one of the things we need is to have a more complete policy toolkit that can deliver well-being um, rather than GDP growth that can deliver well-being within planetary boundaries. There's a wide range of possible ideas out there. I think you know, ranging from limiting the scope of advertising, you know, which is really based on trying to generate dissatisfaction with what we have in order to encourage more consumption, you know, or policies that aim to reduce the inequalities that undermine well-being. Um, but the third point that I really want to emphasize is this need to address the growth dependency of the economy. And, and I think that last point's really, really key if we're going to be able to act on a post-growth steady state vision. And that's, you know, it's a point I've tried to emphasize as being a fundamental obstacle. So there's a lot of you know, there's, there's some key questions that we, you know, need some, some better answers to. Um, you know, one of the questions is how to safeguard basic needs and provide economic security, you know, without economic growth. There are a lot of, now, there also been some options, ideas that are being put forward, um, you know, that there's a lot of debate around, you know, ideas about basic income, minimum income guarantee, ideas of work time reduction policies in order to address the employment issue um, and increase well-being in non-material ways. There's been proposals for a job guarantee so people's economic security isn't tied to the overall state of the economy. Um, 
There's also key questions about how to ensure the governments have the revenues to pay for programs that are important for well being, even in an economy without growth. Again, there's a lot of different proposals that have been there. Certainly, I think you know these the, the, op, the options include you know more equitable forms of taxation, you know much higher taxation on high incomes and wealth, you know efforts to avoid, to crack down on tax evasion. There's potential for significant revenues from environmental taxes, cap and trade systems. Um, if we want to think a little more radically, and I think we do, I think we need to. We could start thinking about. Um, the public taking an ownership stake in more enterprises to give a source of revenue and dividends from the from that ownership stake. Uh, we could also think in terms of more emphasis on things like a preventative approach in, in areas like healthcare to reduce revenue needs. So there's a very big set of questions here. I'm not claiming to have anything close to full answers here, but these are the things the types of the issues that need to be worked through. And there is some encouraging academic work that, that's starting to wrestle with these issues, particularly uh, in, in Europe. Now, I'm not sure if, if Gregory or others are willing to take on a role in organizing this, so I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, um, but I'd like to think of this to make this the first of many di discussions to you know, explore the possibilities for a post-growth future, also to, to wrestle with some of these obstacles to overcome. I think these aren't simple issues. I think we need multiple perspectives on them. We need creative thinking about where we can find openings uh, that enable some real moves forward. And I think there could be some value in connecting uh, with some of the debates that I think are advancing in, in, in the UK and Europe. Um, so for example, Tim Jackson in the UK has called for a formal inquiry into reducing the growth dependency of the UK economy. I think that's sort of an interesting sort of line of inquiry to be, you know, to, 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 to stay in touch with. Um, I'd encourage people to support efforts to, you know, to shift the focus from GDP growth towards sustainable well-being and quality of life, but also keep a critical eye open, uh, you know, to, the, to their limits. Um, I think there's importance, there's value in questioning some of the projects that we're seeing in this region that further lock us into a destructive growth path. I'll mention two examples of that. You know, we've seen a lot of proposals in this region in recent years for various types of fossil fuel infrastructure investment projects. I think we've reached a point in time where we need to look at those ideas with a very critical eye. Um, a pet peeve of mine has been some of these highway twinning projects that we're seeing in Nova Scotia. Uh, this point might be a little bit controversial. I realize, you know, I live in the big city, the big city, Halifax, not that big a city, but it's the city. Um, these projects are being put forward as, you know, justified as, you know, meeting the, the interests of rural Nova Scotia. So I'd understand if people take offense, you know, at me raising this point, um, you know, there might even be some limited places, might be some limited places where this work is needed for safety. Uh, but this strike, they strike me as, you know, quite environmentally destructive projects that lead to more fossil fuel, fuel use and sprawl and, and need to be looked at critically. I think um, above all, I'd like to emphasize, encourage people to keep working um, to protect and expand the access that we have to sources of well-being in Atlantic Canada that are outside the sphere measured by GDP. Things like the sense of community, the strong sense of social connections, the beautiful natural spaces. And I think seeing things through a lens um, other than GDP can help us celebrate these forms of wealth and, and build on these strengths. And so just to one last word to conclude, um, you know, the metaphor of, of turning around a tanker ship has often been used to describe the challenge of moving beyond a growth-based economy. I think we're still in the early stages of turning things around. We need to find ways of, of picking up the pace, but I'm also hopeful that an event like this can, can be valuable in starting a conversation about how we turn things around here um, in Atlantic Canada. So let me stop there. Thanks. Anders, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't um, make uh, policy decisions for the Center for Local Prosperity. I'm just an advisor. We're governed by a, a wonderful board of directors who are very thoughtful. But I, I could tell you one of the suggestions as an advisor I would make is what you just said that the Center for Local Prosperity take on this challenge of, of making sure that this discussion that, that, that both, both you and Brian have put forward is not the end of the discussion, but rather the beginning. And, and, I, and I can tell you, I would lobby strongly that the center would keep this dialogue going.
and and I think uh, my lobbying would not be difficult. So I thank I thank you very much, uh, Chris. I mean, um, one thing I know is you're on the ground here, and uh, uh, you I know and your organizations have been successful in doing what you're doing. And, uh, and I suppose that success is in some way going up against the growth monster. Um, but I would like your view on how you think your work locally fits into this refiguring of the economy. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, thanks, Brian and Andrew. I, I would have I think liked uh, a day to go over and absorb what you two just presented and uh, respond to it appropriately. Um, but it does remind me of a number of things um, in my work and kind of the narrative that we're trying to use and build uh, within our communities. Um, that growth monster um, that you mentioned, Gregory, uh, feels like even especially uh, in these times um, with the unveiling of Canada's history, uh, we've been fighting the ideology of this growth monster for the past 400, 500 years. And uh, we're starting to he hear have people uh, listening to us about our idea ideology that hasn't been um, removed from us and uh, we've continued on and um, want to continue on sharing with uh, the rest of the uh, society right to uh, create a better world for us um, I, I think first thing um, was uh, reminded of um, in, in Brian's presentation right away was, I, I mean, actually your, your words, uh, Gregory, was um, uh, the wits, you know, that uh, worldviews, institutions, and technologies as the um, kind of what's, what saves us. But in, in, in our communities, um, I would change us change that into worldviews, people, and technology. One of our uh, beliefs as Indigenous people is is that we, you know, you, you've heard. I'm sure all of you have heard um, that we are all connected, uh, that we are all are inter interrelated. And we use the term uh, "imsid noma," which translates into uh, all my relations. And, um, but when non-natives hear that, non-Indigenous people hear that, all my relations, they automatically assume that it is all my relations as human beings, but it's not, right? It is respecting um, the, uh, the birds, the forests, the insects, and the fish. Um, you look at my background there, uh, you see force, you see when I, you know, uh, going back to what uh, Brian had mentioned about the uh, traffic levels, a lot of people see them as producers right away. In actual fact, we're also the producers and they're at the top of the pyramid. But we have a tendency with our ideology to put ourselves in the top of the pyramid um, always in any, any way we measure. Uh, or provide a new measurement, we go to that same ideological fight that we've always had is that we put ourselves at the top of the pyramid. When in fact, there is no pyramid, but it's more of a circle or a ball, whatever you wanna call it. And we, we exist in that bubble. And it, it reminds me, I forget where I, I used an analogy, uh, but, the ideological, the ideological difference that we have amongst indigenous and non-indigenous uh, or, or those that don't believe in um, the interrelatedness of all our species, I compared it to the flat earther uh, same, same thing. 
if you don't believe in how interrelated we are and how if you if you are that naive to to say that technology is going to solve everything and that we we don't have to worry about species or extension of species then it's the equivalent of believing in a flat earth and going back to those levels of that we're somehow existing above the space above every everything else and we've always said and even going back to um how we wrote our treaties and how we expressed our treaty relationships with uh, within Mi'kmaq here was never about putting um, ourselves above the needs of the force above the needs of the animals above the needs of the fish you know it was about like you mentioned it was about sustainability it was about coexistence not coexistence with the col col colonials col colonizers it was coexistence with everybody else right and that was that that was the message we were trying to push back 250 300 years ago Right? And we continue to do that. Um, so the, the, the terms that we use uh, and we continue, continuously to throw out there was this like, uh, uh, you know, we don't leave each other behind, uh, which includes uh, this other species as well. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the analogy of the uh, fishery. Um, when they're saying that we don't, um, okay, we'll watch for the extent, we make sure the salmon doesn't go exist, uh, extinct. And in our ideology, uh, the majority is that we don't want that salmon to ex be extinct because we want it on our kitchen table. We don't care whether it exists or not. We just want to eat it and enjoy it, right? That's a different ideology. And uh, even with, um, I think, with uh, money um, and wealth, you know, you look at wealth and it, it is just uh, really gives us um, uh, an ability to, in the future, to extract. Um, I think, uh, Ryan, you mentioned uh, future extraction of natural capital. Who I forget who brought that up. But that's basically what wealth gives us. Wealth gives us the future ability to, to uh, use those goods and services at the expense of others. It was never the indigenous way to kill off the animals so that we can store them and keep them away from, from other tribes. Right? It was always about sustainability, about keeping that balance between uh, our tribes, but also with the animals so that they could sustain us as well. There's no different than how we should operate in an economy and making sure that we are, uh, you know, have the respect of uh, living species and um, being able to have a sustainable future uh, with them, not without them or at their expense. Um, I'm, I was also reminded. Uh, Andrew, you, you brought up uh, um, like the genuine uh, uh, progress indicator and the human development index. I think last time we looked at the human development index, we were like uh, in comparison to something that was like uh, three quarters of the way down in terms of a, uh, equivalent to the country that was three quarters of the way down. And we were in Canada, which is I think top five, right? So when we're trying to borrow capital and go to the World Bank, they tell us, well, you're too up in the high, uh, index, high in the index as you can't, you got to go to Canada. Well, in Canada, we're in 58 or 60, right? So that's, that's our reality here. And um, I've been involved in the Engage Nova Scotia uh, effort as well. And I guess in a parallel, we did worked on the Nova Scotia Economic Development Strategy under that whole um, um, teaching of we don't leave each other behind. Uh, it was a Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Economic Development Strategy. 
But when you look at Engage Nova Scotia, I think it's over five years now uh, that's been around. Um, they still have trouble in capturing the, uh, data for Indigenous and African Nova Scotian demographics. Yet you want to continue and, and measure Nova Scotia's quality of life without those that are um, at the most trouble, right? And uh, you, you just keep on riding on. You want to ride that train, keep going without uh, bringing those on board that are uh, having those issues. I, I guess in, in terms of how we operate as a community, um, you know, I think you touched on a little bit uh, there, Andrew, at the end, as one of the answers was kind of that public ownership speak, right? And um, basically, that's how we operate as First Nation communities across Canada. And it's, 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 um, it, it's actually out of necessity, because there's a, a lot of gaps in funding that aren't provided by the federal government um, and, and provincial. Uh, that we have to fill with our own source of revenues from social um, from businesses, and which end up basically um, large social enterprises. And uh, we, we we've been tracking communities um, in Atlantic Canada for roughly a decade now, uh, where uh, we came up with a product um, called the Community Financial Review under our uh, charitable organization. And uh, we, um, we analyzed their audited statements over 10, 15 years and we present them in pictographs to the communities. And that shows where they've, um, their growth in the past decade or well, has been basically um, done through own source revenues, through own in their own businesses. And governments uh, flatlined. You know, I think when Paul Martin was finance minister, you know, he put a, um, he flatlined that growth in, I think, 2% a year, you know, while the uh, Indigenous um, demographics were growing at, I think, 6% or something like that. And that was, I think, five, six years. And that hasn't much, grown much uh, over the uh, last decade as well. And so in uh, terms of capital too, it's um, the access to capital, there are barriers, of course. Um, Indian Act doesn't help because it's in, uh, in conflict with the Bank Act. Uh, but with the access to capital, um, First Nation communities don't have access to capital like municipalities do, right? So they don't, they, they've, not until the First Nations Finance Authority, which, um, which is about almost a decade now. But before that, they were basically borrowing from the banks that uh, you can practically call them credit card rates, right, for infrastructure like that. And instead of providing a 25, 30 year loan for infrastructure, they have to do a five year, 10 year loans. And imagine the effects on cash flow within the communities like that, right, having to grow. So um, over the years, we've worked a lot with the communities where uh, now um, the First Nations Finance Authority as a national body uh, has able to, it's been able to access, I think now about $200 million from private capital to actually provide capital for First Nations people. And, um, you know, we're proud to say in Atlantic Canada that on a per capita basis, um, we're the best in nationally. And because I think one of them is we've worked closely with the communities in realizing their effects on their decisions um, on their cash flows and uh, measuring um, uh, their acquisition of capital and stuff and, and debt capacity. So going back to how communities are now, um, so we are social enterprises, um, communities, own multi-million dollar uh, companies now, multi-million dollar organizations, corporations. There's a few of them in Nova Scotia, a few of them in New Brunswick, Atlantic Canada. And uh, most recently you've heard them even as a nation purchase uh, 
uh, getting into cannabis. Uh, most recently was the big uh, purchase of Clearwater Seafoods. It's a half a billion dollar per acquisition there. Um, and then all those uh, dividends eventually and, and profits uh, go to the communities um, and it's distributed uh, equitably. So there is no wealth creation in terms of personal wealth. It is all program development. It's going to social programs, the way we, even the way we uh, treat our elders in our communities is different. Um, goes to uh, education programs, recreation programs, uh, social programs. And uh, that's basically how we operate. And uh, I see that as one of the things that uh, uh, Atlantic Canada can, can uh, replicate uh, very easily. Um, and also, um, you know, I, I think with, with uh, controlling of uh, those funds um, that are our, our own source revenues and don't come from the federal and provincial government, we do take on those, uh, again, those preventive measures that you talked about as well, preventive approaches where you talk about healthcare. You know, we, uh, we as an organization have dipped our toes into the world of philanthropy. So um, even that, the world of philanthropy wasn't accessible to the First Nation communities uh, in the past 100 years. Um, and it was just a uh, um, legislation through, uh, I think, in income tax or CRA anyway, uh, but which it didn't allow the, allow the flow of funds from the philanthropic sector into the First Nation communities because we weren't registered as qualified donees or so automatically registered as any other municipality as in Canada. So we, each community has to go through a process to get designated as a qualified donee. And uh, we did that for the communities in Atlantic Canada. So that capital as well, um, we did not have access to. One of the other sources of capital uh, that develop, develops communities. And uh, we have just begun that in say the last uh, five years, access in that. Um, in terms of private capital, we know it, uh, we only had uh, the um, two tenths of the share of uh, capital in Canada in all, in all in these communities. What I was surprised of was a recent report by philanthropy that um, we only had, uh, I, I believe, 1% um, of philanthropic uh, donations actually go to Indigenous causes, Indigenous uh, organizations. Um, that was a surprise to me, cons considering uh, what what philanthropy is all about, and uh, even the latest developments in, in, with um, First Asian communities and Indigenous communities that's been highlighted in the past decade, you know, and, uh, but we're changing that as well. We're building bridges and uh, working with um, key, some really great partners in that sector and uh, continue to um, teach our communities that this is another source of capital. Uh, that they can develop their communities and they can develop their uh, next generation of um, uh, Indigenous kids that are coming up as leaders as well. Um, but uh, I think, like I said, like uh, how I started. For me, I, I think the huge thing that's really necessary and without it, I don't think uh, we'll, we'll change the trajectory of um, where we're headed to is if we don't uh, have an ideological shift. Um, and we don't, when we measure, um, set aside measuring the economy, we measure society. If we don't measure, measure society and include all our relations and set dogma, um, I think we'll be staying on that train and we're going to crash it. And it's, it's ironic that we think that uh, when we put ourselves on top of that pyramid, uh, we're a species that can change that uh, train, but we don't. And it reminds me when I, I forget who was talking, I think it was you, Brian, what you were saying, it reminded me of that video that you always see on the YouTube of those um, mouse that keep going into the bucket, look, eating that grain. 
word of mouth going into the bucket, consuming. We can't stop it, right? And uh, that's what it kind of reminded me of. And uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that, Chris. Chris, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I just, as I, as I hear you talk and I hear the other talk, I, just, I, I continually try and find and I can see this common ground. And uh, it's certainly common in me that, that my political work and I suppose my economic work began in some sort of deep rootedness in, 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 in feeling and trying to understand this interconnectedness of all life. And I know, I don't want to speak for, for Brian, but I know he started his career as a wildlife biologist. And I think that work led him to shift to this economic work. Uh, and, and, I, and I'd like to ask him to, to comment on, on that in a second. But one of the things uh, when, when I hear all, all three of you talk that, that I've never quite got straight in my mind, is it seems like to find the amount of success we need in the time that we need to do it, because this is one of those super wicked problems. It's not only a wicked problem, but it's super wicked because it's time sensitive. Is how do you put these initiatives, Chris, like you have in place, and that I think are very successful um, on social enterprise, local finance, um, and, and what, what Anders is talking about, a, a shift to uh, uh, a, a political stance that's other than growth that may be on more of an emphasis on the well-being of a community. It seems to me for, for that to happen and quickly enough, there has to be some strategy to in a sense deconstruct all those other stressors that are operating in terms of the, the world global structure. Um, and I suppose that's my way of saying uh, two things. How, how do we begin to, and it's one of the questions that's come up, matter of fact, I think it's come up a couple of times uh, as I read my screen here. Uh, how, how do we create the, legal, the, the political incentives or I suppose the political will of elected officials in, in Atlantic Canada one, to educate themselves on, Chris, what you're doing, and Anders, what you're doing, and, and Brian, what, what you're doing, uh, of putting forth a new view, um, um, what, what you usually, Chris, a new ideology, a, a new economic program. How do, how do we put that in place and, and sell it to communities and politicians? in the time frame that we need to do it in. How do we create that political shift that's so important and, and to be able to stop from doing what I know we're doing in most of Atlantic Canada, instead of doing that shift, we just overlay something on it. Instead of bringing an end to clear cutting, we, we put these little caveats in there that allow us to feel like we're protecting this interconnected piece and that we're preserving biodiversity. When we're, con when we're continuing to allow the clear cutting to happen at about at the scale that it does, how do we begin to do that political will uh, to, to shift that? And, and Brian, uh, Brian, I'd like to, what, what's, what's been your success in selling your message to the political systems? Because I know you've, You've, you've operated globally in a lot of your work. What's the key here? Well, we haven't had tons of success, <laughs> but you can't, we, we can't give up. And I think we have to realize we're on a runaway train. We have ecosystems unraveling all around us. And a lot of species will go extinct and a lot of ecological integrity will be lost. It's in the process. We're in the process of losing it. And it's in the process of being lost. And we, uh, I think we have to recognize that 
there are different kinds of runaway trains and even uh, different speeds of runaway train. And if we can manage to slow it down some, at the end of the day, you know, seven generations from now, there will be uh, more pieces left to, to pick ourselves back up with and to, uh, to save from going, ex more species to save from going extinct and so on. So we can never give up. I mean, uh, we see the bad news around us all the time. I think that one thing that we have that has been deemed relatively successful at times is, like I mentioned before, we do have 15,000 people that are calling explicitly for a steady state economy. And that position, it doesn't specify in which polity, you know, in Nova Scotia and you know, in the USA and in, in Wyoming and in the European Union, it's in, in general. And so, yes, we do have kind of a global uh, front and we're, it's a, it's a work in progress to see who's going to step up to leadership the most effectively. So far, I, I have to uh, say it sure as heck doesn't look like it's the USA. Uh, we see a lot more a lot more leadership, I would say, in Australia at this particular time uh, in terms of more or less a grassroots interest in advancing the steady state economy. Uh, I, I feel that there's got to be more unity in terms of how we, we uh, frame the debate, what terminology we use. There, I do know people out there uh who have the uh the idea that the opinion that you know it doesn't really matter what we call it uh as long as we're all after conservation and and we're we are all after trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and so on doesn't matter what it's called i disagree wholeheartedly with that, I feel that uh, this is a political issue as well as it is ecological and economic, obviously. And so to be effective politically, it's kind of like a candidate uh, uh, for office with name recognition. You know, that's huge for, in electoral politics. Well, I believe it's huge in issue politics also to uh, have unity around a, a recognizable mm, name of what we're after. And so what are we trying to achieve here? If it's not perpetual, if it's not, you know, this horribly destructive GDP growth, uh, you know, there is a little bit of success in Europe with pitching the idea of degrowth. And, and we're for that too. You know, we like to say degrowth toward a steady state economy. But I really encourage people to start, uh, frankly, adopting the, the, the term that there is some traction building for, you know, which I think is why you called this, uh, this Zoom conference together, Gregory, and, you know, uh, a steady state effort in Atlantic Canada, steady state economy. Let's call it what it is. If you look out the window and you like what you see, you want to keep it like that? Or you want to flood it with yeah, twin roads and you know mountaintop removal and uh, dam river? Uh, probably not. You'd rather keep it like that if you like what you see when you look out the window. And that's the I think a very successful way to communicate what a steady state economy is. There's nothing fancy about it. You know the just because it's got the econ syllables in it steady state economy, it starts to scare some people away. It sounds too, too complicated, I guess, or whatever. But if somebody asks, well, what would a steady state economy look like? Tell them to look out the window. And if things kept looking like that, well, that's a steady state economy. Um, I'm sure, I think that a lot of tribes, you know, I worked for uh, several tribes, tribal governments, uh, when I was a wildlife biologist. And, and I, it saddens me that I suspect a lot of tribes would have looked at, looked backwards at the lands and the wildlife and, 
as they were maybe 300 years ago and thought that's when the steady state economy should have been established. And I'm probably more aligned with that opinion than the, the more common opinions today that we need to have a little more GDP growth before we think about, you know, uh, tapering off the size of the economy. So that's a, that's a wide ranging response, Gregory. I, uh, Great. I don't Thank have, you. I, I want to say one more thing, actually, though, that Please. eventually success is going to require really big policy reform. And our biggest success there so far is, you know, we are developing for the USA, the full and sustainable employment act or full seas act, we like to call it. And that is to replace the central uh, economic policy legislation of the United States, which is the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act of 1978, with an act of Congress that literally explicitly uh, announces and calls by governmental uh, regulatory and administrative means a transition from all these growth, growth uh, programs that we currently have on the books to uh, the transition out of those off that growth path to the steady state economy. And that's in fiscal and monetary and trade policy. Great. Thank you. Here's a, a, a question that that um, that I think is real important. It came from Peter, uh, one of our participants online here. He asked a question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, it, it dates back. And, and I think, Anders, you may have a sense of this and and i'd like uh, uh uh chris if, if you have a view on this but it sounds like according to peter in 2007 there was a talk and i've heard the talk since that of, of putting in place uh this requirement i suppose that any new policy any new project uh, uh has to uh uh be um exemplified i suppose with their full cost accounting we you know some of the projects that come before us now they have to have a an environmental review and other things but this idea of, of having a requirement that the project has to meet the requirements of full cost accounting and peter's suggesting that there may at one time have been a, um, a classroom um, a class at dalhousie on just that does that does anything ring a bell uh, there, Anders? Um, well, the date 2007 is a, a little before my time. Um, I'm one of the few people that grew up in Alberta and moved here for a job, but that wasn't until 2010. So um, that definitely could have could have ex could have existed at Dalhousie. Um, uh, but I, I'm not familiar with the details, but it's certainly the concept, I think, is extremely important. Um, I think one of the um, one of the interesting things that came out of the Maryland GPI initiative um, was um, attempts at doing uh, cost benefit analysis differently um, and sort of um, in the spirit of full cost accounting. So they did some, some pilot work there in terms of looking at uh, state spending options. So they looked at, for example, the idea of, you know, is it worth, it for the state to buy wetlands or forested lands, or should they sell them off for you know strip malls and suburban development? And if you did the full cost accounting of all the ecosystem services that were provided by that land, it made it was more economic value for the state, you know, to leave those lands un, undeveloped than to you know than to sort of you know than to than to develop them in, in terms of conventional suburban development. So those definitely those, those approaches I think can be. Uh, can be very, very valuable. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris. The, the, the whole idea of a full cost accounting does that figure into uh, your work as a, a CEO of, of uh, the projects that you do? Uh, I, I remember the concept very back um, years ago. Yeah, um, I think one of the things, and it, it reminds me of kind of our work in um, philanthropy right now, where. Um, even in social finance and um, the basic concept, best bang for the buck, even in cost accounting, best bang for the buck, right? And uh, 
but in philanthropy, um, that that model was is still being used. And what we uh, um, I was part of the development, one of the founders for the National Resilience Fund, uh, it's a philanthropic new fund, National Fund, and. Uh, we discussed the, kind of that concept about that we're not going, we're not looking at project for best bang for the buck for philanthropic dollars. Uh, we'll support it if it needs our support. And it's very subjective, right? And I think that's where we, uh, as a group, really looked at different projects in different ways than what philanthropic, like the McConnells and the massacres looked at and all these other foundations. Um, so I, I think there's a good and bad to that. Um, yeah. Here's uh, another question that, that that's arisen here, and it's it's something that's near and dear to my work. At one time, I made the, the, this statement to a group of people that that nothing is going to work in terms of a, an economic shift or a political shift until we find a a meaningful way, a strategy, I, I suppose, to deal with two issues. I think in some ways it's fairly, it's easier to deal with the growth of consumption because I can see a way that um, if we just get the advertisers to think differently, that I think we can generate um, a, um, an advertising moment where to do with less is better. At least I think that's possible. I can see that. Um, but this idea of controlling the population, population growth. And I know uh, one, one of the people that's worked with the Center for Local Prosperity very closely is, is Paul Hawken and, 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 um, uh, and Chad Frischman from the uh, uh, Drawdown Solutions Project. And one of their things are the education of, of, um, of women and children to, uh, to, to in a sense, deal with the problem of, of population. I suppose my question is, uh, uh, Brian, does your work deal with the pressures of population in terms of any sort of strategy in any sort of any, any work along that level that would give some correlation between economic growth, consumption and population? Yeah, we're forced to be all over that issue because uh, 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 by way of, uh, I'll get in there by way of my experience in the federal government in the US. I, so I was with tribal governments and I also spent 20 years in the headquarters of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I was gagged. I couldn't talk about the conflict between economic growth and wildlife conservation. And uh, we started referring to that. We in the Fish and Wildlife Headquarters started referring to economic growth as the 800 pound gorilla because we couldn't talk about it. Even though everybody knew it was there, it's a big problem. The 800, and the 800 pounders got, got two arms, population and per capita consumption. And you really can't wrestle with that gorilla without dealing with both arms because you're gonna have uh, a push politically for the growth of one, if the even if the other one is somehow defeated politically, and uh, you know they grow in tandem, they really do, and it's actually kind of complicated when it comes to economic growth theory how they're related uh, via the number of minds that are out there in order to produce the ideas to raise the bar for further GDP, but let me just put it in uh, very simple terms, economists, the economics profession, they want population growth, not just for the sake of more uh, consumers out there, but for the sake of higher GDP per capita. Per capita, it's shocking, right? Not only will more people result in a higher GDP, but higher GDP per capita because of the increased number of brains out there. It just, it's crazy stuff. But anyway, so we have to deal with both. Uh, maybe the most specific one I'll say, I'll, I'll present uh, quickly that kind of distinguishes Cassie a little bit, I think is we call for 
I think the only real sane approach for uh, immigration issues. And in, let's take the, the, a very classic one with the USA and the Mexican border. We say uh, that pursuant to steady statesmanship, we do need to tighten the borders, including that Mexican border. But it would be foolish to do that while we're still hell bent on GDP growth. It makes you look like the biggest pig at the trough in international diplomacy. And that's not good for national security. And, uh, and it's just the wrong thing to do, period. Uh, you know, to heck with national security, it's just wrong. But if, if all you care about is the power of the country or something, uh, like Anders alluded to earlier, you know, it's uh, some of the reasons that GDP is held up there so preeminently because uh, it's viewed as, as uh, an indicator of national power. It's really uh, not smart to, to prevent really poverty stricken people from other parts of the world to get in here while we're grasping at all the natural capital we can get out there on the planet to grow GDP. So our, uh, our policy proposal at Cassie is to uh, tighten those borders and to announce that we're gonna tighten those borders given a pre-existing condition, namely that we concurrently announce or we first announce that we are getting off the growth path because we see how it's tearing up the planet and starting with our own country. And we're going to move toward the steady state economy. Uh, and as we succeed in doing that, we're gonna tighten those pores. And what uh, surplus we may have, we're going to devote some of that to trying to help uh, people in those regions of the world who are so desperate to get out of where they are that they're going to come through the hell uh, circuit of getting through that that Mexican border. And so uh, that's how that's one of the ways we deal with population. In a lot of countries, the the native, if you will, you know, in the these the terms of these days, the native growth rate is fairly, uh, would result in a fairly stabilized population. So that's not as big of an issue. Uh, in terms of per capita consumption, we've had our idea on that is a sort of uh, a psychological approach to that. We like to call it the steady state revolution in public opinion that would entail, uh, well, <laughs> to put it bluntly, what we call the castigation of the liquidating class. <laughs> and the liquidating class, that, those are those one percenters you mentioned right at the beginning, Gregory, you know, the, uh, that are gonna be on the biggest hills with the biggest guns and the biggest gates around them as these ecosystems unravel. We feel that uh, given like a psychological theory like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, uh, that we can turn the tables on say the Donald Trumps of the world and the, the, the ridiculous levels of conspicuous consumption where those uh, consumers feel that they're somehow displaying some greatness with, through that consumption. Turning the tables on that uh, would really uh, amount to lowering the propensity to consume basically kind of shaming that kind of consumptive consumption behavior. And then that could have a real rapid uh, positive or positive feedback in the downward direction of, of per capita GDP. Great. So it's both population and, and per capita. Great, Th Brian, th thank you. Uh, we've got just a, a few minutes left here and uh, uh, I want to return and I suppose close up with just a quick story and then I want to I want to turn it over to, to Chris if, if I could get him to share some insights on this but uh, in um, I guess about 15 20 years ago now uh, I retired from from a business that I had 
in terms of building homes and started building very small homes, energy efficient, and ended up with the, where, where things are going. Everything we built was 6,000, 8,000 square feet for a couple with two, two people, high income earners without children. They wanted at least that they wanted a formal dining room. And, uh, and I, I, got, I got to a place where I couldn't live with myself to continue that. So I, I decided to move to the Yukon, a very remote place, because I just wanted to reconnect with the natural world again. And I thought the Yukon would be a great place to do it. There, there are more moose than people there, 30,000 people, about 26,000 live in white, 26,000 live in white horse, the rest within a quarter mile of Alaska highway, and the rest is absolute wilderness. So I showed up in this little town that I ended up settling in for about almost 11 years. And um, I, in the center of town was this huge plastic sculptural piece. It must have been 30 feet high. And uh, it looked like a um, kind of a pyramid, bigger at the bottom, gets smaller at the top. And at the very bottom were, were a, were um, repl replicable earthworms and slugs and you go up a little higher you get into some of the carnivores and then, uh, you, and then you get into the, the young you let you get into some hooks hoof stuff moose up at the top and at the very top there's a man in Bermuda shorts with a pair of binoculars looking down at all of creation and I thought this is exactly what I wanted to get away from, is that sort of view. Because I think what I was looking for, and I was hoping I could find it in a small remote place, is some sort of methodology to create this uh, ideological shift that Chris, that you talked about. And what I've discovered, I think, is that's not something you can teach in a classroom or out of a textbook. It's something that you have to experience. Can you comment on how you see your indigenous view? Um, how do you see teaching that to the broader population? I, I think you said it there, Gregory. It, it's about the experience. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you an example of a, of a recent uh, purchase that we did as a foundation, um, which we, we purchased, um, um, was a purchase and a gift from a family that um, have been uh, stored in this forest in Nova Scotia, uh, the 1% that still exists pre-colonial. And uh, 200 acres, I think around 70, 80 acres is uh, the uh, Wabanaki Forest, pre-colonial. Uh, pre and uh, we purchased that under the charity. And before uh, that family was a family that uh, stored that for 130 years. Um, so our main purpose for that uh, Purchase has been to uh, use it as an educational and healing center because we, um, I think that's where that experience uh, could be provided. Is that going back to um, Brian, what you had said, you know, or, or some of, I, th I, don't, I forget who said it, but looking at that sustainable economy back 300 years ago is actually placing you in that force and looking at that force, what it looked like back 500 years ago, 600 years ago. And uh, when you think back about, you know, I, I started out saying that we had aspirations of a sustainable economy when the uh, first ships arrived. And, and in that force there, you could get a sense of that, what that actually meant. And you can take, you know, teach a lot about history as well as to what kind of aspirations our people had back then and what kind of connection we actually aspired to have. And even with the colonizers that came on, on, on first uh, then, what kind of aspirations did they have? They didn't have aspirations of this 1% up here, right? They never had, I don't think they ever had that. They wanted to go away from that actually. 
they have, but they had the sense of local communities that uh, you know everybody shared in wealth equity, and that's where I think uh, one of the things where we we are trying to share our ideology like that. And I know it's a hard battle because that ideology exists in our uh, in capitalism. It exists in our public education system from the very first days that children go into the school. It exists there uh, in how we teach our kids. Um, but I, I think for us, it's it's changing the narrative uh, and showing actually uh, in those spaces what it actually means to live a sustainable economy where relationships do matter and people do matter. Because going back to your uh, uh, wit thing, worldviews, institutions, technologies, institutions are not alive. And, and we fight to keep them. We give them rights even better than human beings. And they're, they only exist on paper, right? And, and we don't do the same for people. And that's the ideological shift that I'm talking about is we have to go back to our worldview and it's about people. And then you can bring technology, but it has to be based on worldviews and people. Chris, thank you. Uh, Brian, thank you. And Anders, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, um, to share a bit of your life's work. I, you know. This is not something that you got into just yesterday, you decided to choose it as a career. It becomes a life path. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so thank you, thank you all. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, think Chris just said about rights, if I could hinge on that for just a second. Uh, I'm hoping that the audience here and, and uh, will catch, uh, have an interest in catching these dialogues as they go on. And just briefly, the one on uh, uh, July uh, 14th, it's called Empowering the Rights of Nature Revolution in Atlantic Canada. And it's all about the rights of nature. And uh, that's an interesting group of speakers. Uh, uh, Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall, eco-justice lawyer Sarah McDonald, or, uh, yeah, Sarah McDonald, Tina Northrup, a lawyer from East Coast Environmental Law, and Pierre Boudre, uh, Olivier Boudre from uh, CPAWS in the conservation director in Ontario, who's worked intimately to secure legal rights for the Magpie River. And uh, uh, so that discussion is going to be all around this notion, I think, that uh, nature has rights, people have responsibilities. So that's what we're gonna focus on. And uh, so I thank you very much. And I hope to see many of you on the 14th of July. Um, so here's with great hope that we see some sort of legal standing for nature in Atlantic Canada. So let's talk again on uh, July 14th. I thank you all very much. Thank you, Gregory.